بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاه والسلام على رسول الله وعلى اله وصحبه ومن والاه ثم اما بعد to proceed so let us go over the second chapter today which is the chapter on the maintenance of relatives and slaves باب نفقه الاقارب والمماليك وعلى الانسان الامام ابن القدامه رحمه الله died in the year 620 after the hijra said in his book عمده uh, الفقه which is a Hanbali manual. Wa'ala uh, al-Insani, under the chapter of Babna Faqad al-Aqarab al-Mamalik, chapter on maintenance of uh, relatives and slaves. Wa'ala al-Insani, nafaqat walidayhi wa in alaw, wa awladihi wa in safalu, min, wa man yarithuhu bi fardin aw ta'asib, idha kanu fqara'a wa lahu ma yunfiq alayhim. It is mandatory to spend on one's parents, his grandparents, however many generations up, his children and their descendants, however many generations down, and those from whom one inherits, whether in the form of designated shares, that is, you know, furud, or residuaries, that is ta'asib, this is the case uh, when they are poor and one has money to spend on them. Three conditions he mentioned here in this paragraph for one to be responsible for uh, their relatives. What are those three conditions? One, uh, they're close relatives. So he mentions here, Amuda and Nasab, which is basically the pillars of his lineage, which means his ancestors and descendants. They have different ruling and descendants. They have different ruling, rulings in all the Mazahab. And then, those from whom you inherit. If you inherit from them, you're responsible for them. If you inherit from them when they die, you are responsible for them when they are alive. Is that clear? That's the Hanbali madhab here. Okay? And we will come to talk about the others shortly. The second condition is that, that he mentioned here is a kanu fuqara, if they are needy. The third condition that he mentioned here is walahu mayunfiq alayhim, and he, he is capable. So the, 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 the sustainer is capable because la yukallifu allahu nafsan illa. Allah does not be burdened a soul beyond its capacity. Now if he is capable of earning, will we force him to earn, to spend on his relatives? Yes, the Hanbalis will force him to, to earn. They'll first force him to go to work. Yeah, yes. So if you have poor relatives that you're responsible for, and you are broke, but you are capable of earning, they'll force you to go to work, to spend on them. Huh? I, I am not, I, I don't know about the Malikis. I'm sure that the Hanbaris would force him to earn. Uh, so now, if, uh, and now they need to be needy. Okay, this condition. So sustainer is capable. Capable meaning what? Not necessarily wealthy, but capable of earning. Even capable of earning. So either wealthy, he has the money, or he's able to earn it they will tell him to earn it. Okay, now, so this is one condition. The other condition is needy. What does that mean? That these people that he will spend on, they, uh, he will not be required to spend on them unless they are needy. What is the exception in the Hanbali Mazhab only? The father can take from the child regardless of the father's need. That is not Hanafi, Maliki, or Shafi'i. Hanafi, Maliki, or Shafi'i, they say that the father will take from the child only what he needs. Hanbalis, you and your money uh, are your fathers. Uh, or you and what you, are, what you own are your fathers. So the father can basically casually come in and say, well, <laughs> <laughs> mm. but, but, they, they added a condition. 
من غيري أن يضر بالولد without causing harm to the child because you know no matter what those scholars those fuqaha are were always sensible so they always made sure that they are sensible without causing harm to the child so like Messi's father for instance uh, you know he like is living a, a very good life decides that he wants a uh, like a bigger mansion he goes to his son and he says, well, you know, just, I need a bigger mansion. Uh, and it is likely not going to harm his son. It's likely not going to harm his son. So but the idea here is to make the child, the idea that the Hanbalis wanted to get across is that the child should understand that you are basically the property of your father. So you should be grateful to your father, you should be respectful, you should be this and this and that. Anyway, uh, now th that, that even applies, that, does that apply to daughters and sons? Yes, it applies to daughters and sons. Hmm? Like, the, a, a, who's responsible to maintain their parents? The sons only or the do daughters as well? The daughters as well are responsible to maintain their parents. The daughters as well are responsible to maintain their parents. So anta omalukari applies to the son and uh, the daughter. Certainly if they are wealthy, if they, if they are well off, if they are capable, then it applies to both. So needy, that is everybody except the Father, who else, who else, aside from the father, so minus father, that's Hanbali only, but it, father is also included here. But who else is minus here by agreement, by consensus, wife? Because that is a contractual relationship. This is not out of the kindness of his heart. This is a contractual relationship. We get married, you support me. It's a contractual relationship, part of the marriage contract. Therefore, it is like if she's not needy, she has like $5 million in her bank account, she wants him to spend on her because he is the husband. Then he is required. Now, all the arrangements nowadays when the career women and women, women who work and so on, and then they sit down and figure out, you know, how to make this equitable and since she's not dedicated, and that's a different story. These are different stories, but let's say she has wealth, but she's not going to work. She is a dedicated housewife, homemaker. But she has wealth. She inherited millions of dollars from her parents. Now, is he responsible to spend on her? Yes, even though she's not needy. So needy will apply to any relatives aside from the wife, according to the consensus, and the father according to the hambalis. So needy this is another condition. Uh, now, what about closeness? that need to be close relatives. We said, try to remember this because so that you don't confuse yourself. Um, you're being Hanbali. So you try to remember this and then the comparative stuff, like keep it a little bit, uh, the peripheries of your mind. Uh, so close relatives, it means ancestors and descendants according to the Hanbali madhab, as well as ev those from whom you inherit those from whom you inherit. Ancestors and descendants, no matter how many generations up, no matter how many generations down, no matter what their gender is. No matter what their gender is, no matter how many generations up, no matter how many generations down. You're all, you're responsible for everything that you came from or that came from you. Okay, now the, uh, people that you, from whom you inherit, if they are needy and you are capable, 
And your, let us say, nephew who, uh, from whom you will inherit, from whom you will inherit. And there is no one, no one to block you from, the, from inheriting from them. Like your brother died, so you will inherit from your nephew. You're not blocked. You will inherit from your nephew. Your nephew needs sustenance, you have money, you're responsible. Uh, anyone, you know, all of the, 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 the uh, all of the inheritance, whether it is fard or ta'sib, anyone that you will inherit from, whether it is fard or ta'sib, your brother, you would inherit from your brother? Yes. yes. Okay. You're responsible to maintain your brother? Yes. Yes, Hambari's yes. yes. We're Hambari here. Hambari's yes. You're responsible to maintain your brother. What if your father is alive? You're not responsible. But what if the father is alive? You're not responsible. Why? Because you are blocked. You are blocked. Guys, try to understand that. Listen, listen. What if your father is, is alive? Your, your brother is here. This is your father. This is your brother. Okay. And let us say this is your grandfather, grandmother. Okay, now this is you, this is you. Your father is alive, you're not responsible for your brother. Your father is not alive and you will actually inherit from your brother, you will inherit from your brother. By Tasib, you are responsible for your brother. What if your grandfather is here, and this is your father, and this is you, and your father is Musir, like your father is capable? Are you responsible for your grandfather? No. no. Your father should be. What? If your father is incapable, incapable, but alive, are you responsible for your grandfather? Yes. yes, even though you are blocked. Why? Because that is an exception when it comes to Amuda and Nasab. For other relatives, if you're blocked, you're not responsible. For the ancestors and descendants, it does not matter. You're blocked, you're not blocked. Only if you are blocked by Musir, someone capable to spend, will you be not responsible. But if you are blocked by someone Musir, incapable, then you are still responsible as long as it is Amud al Nasab. It is the pillars of your lineage, people that you came from or people who came from you up and down from you, no matter how many generations, far away. Then you're not responsible. But if we can consider the kids is not capable also. Not, but, but the idea here is that when it comes to aside from Amuda and Nasab, aside from Amuda and Nasab, if you are blocked, you are blocked, you're not responsible. So this is for the hospitals specifically that are responsible for spending. The males, I mean in this case, right? Uh, with the exception of spending on the father. Or the oh, with the exception of spending on the parents, 
the parents, the, any, the, when it comes to spending on the parents, uh, the woman is like the man. When it comes to spending on the children, what if they are young children? What if they are adult children that are incapable? Is it the man's responsibility only to spend on the incapable adult children? In, these are incapable. No, yes. Huh? No, yes. It is the man's responsibility only to spend on their incapable adult children. According to whom? The majority. Who said not? The Shafi'is. They said it will be one third and two thirds. The mother will be responsible for one third, the father will be responsible for two thirds of their maintenance. That is incapable adult children. When we say incapable adult children, does that mean incapable because they don't have money or incapable of earning? That's controversial. But the stronger position that was chosen by Ibn Taymiyyah and alayhi al-fatwa, which means that this is the, the authorized position to give fatwa, incapable of earning. So if you have like, yes, a child, uh, the, uh, uh, your son is incapable of earning. Not that he wants to wake up at 10 o'clock in the morning and just to, you know, play video games. Uh, no, he is actually incapable of earning, then you are responsible for them. Is that clear? Now, let me go over, okay, I, I will give time for the questions so that we don't <laughs> give time for the questions at the end, because otherwise we will not finish. I just want to finish the other mazahab now. So the, now the, the uh, who said that you are not responsible. The, you see how the Hanbalis are saying those from whom you inherit, aside from the ancestors and descendants. Hanafis are closest to Hanbalis, but with a tweak, a slight difference. What is the slight difference between the Hanafis and Hanbalis? Hanafis say, Kullu rahimin muharram. Every kin that is unmarriageable, you are responsible for them. Whether or not you inherit from them, kullu rahimin muharram. Every person that is unmarriageable, you are responsible for them, whether or not you inherit from them. So if you are a man, what about your uncle? Your uncle. Are you responsible to spend on your uncle? Yes. Yes. Because had he been a woman, he would have been unmarriageable. Switch his gender to be opposite from, switch his gender to be opposite to your gender. If he, was a, if he were a woman, he would have been unmarriageable. Therefore, you are responsible to spend on your uncle. Block to not block to inherit, does not inherit anyone who is unmarriageable. I want to tell you one thing that is important here. The Hanafis in particular, keep in mind, when it comes to zakat, to giving zakat, the general rule that you want to remember is that if you're responsible for them, you can't give them zakat. Now, let us talk about exceptions. There are exceptions, you know, when it comes to, the, the, the exceptions are very limited when it comes to the parents and, uh, the, uh, and, and the, then the, the, the ancestors in, in general. Uh, exception, there is no exception when it comes to the wife. You can't give your zakat to your wife. Spend your wife from your zakat. But there are some exceptions when it comes to the parents. There is some controversy, and I'm not going to go into the details of who said what, but I want you to remember that there is some controversy about this. If you are incapable of spending and you have zakat, you are poor, but you still have zakat to give, 
and you're incapable of taking care of your parents, some said, some scholars said, they would be more deserving to give them this than others. Huh? You have three thousand dollars in the bank. Do you really? Are you really capable? But you have done a sub, and so now, then, uh, when it comes to the Hanafis in particular, aside from the majority, they don't apply this rule that if you if you are required to maintain, you can't give zakat to people beyond the ancestors and uh, descendants. All the other relatives, all the other relatives, it is called the Sila. Sila, uh, they are giving uh, basically because uh, for, for the Sila, Sila al rahim and for them, you can give them zakat according to the Hanafis. So even though the Hanafis widened the circles of those you're required to spend on, they still allowed you to give zakat to them if they are not your wife, your parents, and your kids. They widened the circle of those that you can give zakat to. Now the Hanbalis, if you are required to give zakat, you cannot give them, if you are required to spend on them, you cannot give them zakat. That's the Malikis and Shafis as well. There are some exceptions that, in what sense, Zakat is given for, to people for their poverty, but zakat is given to people for other causes also. What if your father is a ghazi, mujahid? What if your father is a gharim, in debt? This is a different discussion. You ask for a fatwa because there's, there's so much details here. But in terms of zakat for poverty, no, you will not give your zakat to the people that you are required to spend on according to the Hanbalis. Uh, so if you want to remember some like golden rules here, you would never give your zakat to your wife or kids. You will, not, uh, you will almost never give your zakat to your parents, almost. Um, beyond this, just try to figure out, try to review what we talked about and figure out. Now, the Malikis and Shafi'is, they, that is, the Hanafis and Hanbalis, they widen the circle of those that you're responsible for their maintenance. The Malikis and Shafi'is wanted to limit things a little bit and, and, you know, they wanted to remove all this category. They said that the Prophet وسلم, said, Sadaqa ala al miskin, Sadaqa wa ala the rahim, Sadaqatun wasila. That sadaqa, you know, when you give sadaqa to a miskin, that's the Malikis and Shafi'is, when you give sadaqa to a miskin, that counts as sadaqa only. When you give sadaqa to the rahim, it counts as sadaqa and joining the kin, and sila, sila al rahim, joining the kin. They said this means that you could give your zakat to someone that is the rahim. What about? وَعَلَى الْوَارِثِ مِثْلُ ذلك, That is in Surah Al-Baqarah, and upon the heirs, a duty like this. They said this is specific to Rada. This is not about maintenance, this is specific to Rada. And there is much disagreement about, about what the warith here means. But if we agree with you, this is specific to the case of Rada. How did you generalize it to maintenance of everyone? And the end, like I said, they said that the Prophet ﷺ said, Sadaqa ala miskin, Sadaqa ala the rahim, Sadaqatun wasala, that, you know, giving charity to the miskin uh, counts as charity, and giving the charity to a miskin that is related to you counts both as charity and joining the kin. So he wanted to you to prioritize your kin in your charity. And that includes zakah because when the Prophet said sadaqah, he did not only mean the sadaqah that is non-obligatory, but in his lingo, zakat is was called sadaqah. Uh, so the Malikis then said, we will limit this to, the Shafi'is first said, we will limit this to your ancestors and descendants. The wife is out of the question. The wife is always, it's a contractual thing, it is not even talked about here. 
but those that you are responsible for because they are related to you, not a contractual relationship, they're related to you. The Shafi'i said, your ancestors and descendants. The Malik is limited this to your immediate ancestors and descendants, your children and your parents, your children and your parents. Nowadays, you know, we would encourage people to be kind to their relatives, but it seems that the Maliki or the Shafi'i position uh, are more practical nowadays because to demand of someone to be responsible for all their clan, you know, wh whoever is needy in their clan, responsible for their maintenance, it is not like they're giving them charity out of the kindness of their heart, but rather responsible for their maintenance. They will be forced to go out to work to support them it could be overwhelming for many people. So then the Sheikh said, وَإِنْ كَانَ لِلْفَقِيرِ وَارِثَانِ فَأَكْثَرْ فَنَفَقَتُهُ عَلَيْهِمْ عَلَىٰ قَدْرِ مِيرَاثِهِمْ إِلَّا لِبْنَ فَإِنَّ نَفَقَتَهُ عَلَىٰ أَبِيهِ خَاصَّةً If a poor person has two or more heirs, his maintenance is binding on them in proportion to their shares of his inheritance. This excludes the son because his father, or that, that means the, or the daughter. Because his father is already is, uh, responsible for his maintenance. So if the father is there, no one, it's not like let us share and let's figure out who's responsible for what. Father is there, everybody is safe. Father is not there, then everybody will, be, will come in and then we will determine how much do you inherit from this child? This much, you're responsible for this much of their maintenance. How much you inherit from this child? This much. You're responsible for this much of your means. If the child had wealth and died, you would have inherited from them. Therefore, you're close enough to be responsible for them when they don't have wealth and they are in need. وَعَلَى مُلَّاكِ الْمَمْلُوكِينَ الْإِنْفَاقُ عَلَيْهِمْ وَمَا يَحْتَجُونَ إِلَيْهِ مِنْ مُؤْنَةٍ وَكِسْوَةٍ فَإِنْ لَمْ يَفْعَلُوا أُجْبِرُوا عَلَى بَيْعِهِمْ إِذَا طَلَبُوا ذَلِكَ it is binding on the masters of slaves to spend on them and to provide them with the food and clothing they need. If they fail to do that, then they will be forced to sell them if they, the slaves, demand it. If they demand it. And uh, as, as I said before, and you know, the addendum on slavery, because slavery is always an issue that is uh, in our consciousness because of you know, the way slavery has been practiced uh, you know, in uh, modern times or close to modern times, we are, it, uh, we are sort of well, expectedly uh, repulsed by it. But in our consciousness, if you want to talk about slavery and why, why Islam was not a uh, radical abolitionist from day one, uh, the things that you would have to mention are what? Because I mentioned them several times and you guys should be able to remember them. What are the things that you would have to mention? The I said the first thing that we have to mention is we don't want it back. Like that Islam, you know, Afu bil aqud and so on, and it is not all of the explanation that we will provide does not mean that we are basically uh, reminiscing about it when we want it back. Uh, don't want it back. The shara, the legislator, that's God, the divine, is eager to uh, give freedom to people. The second one that we mentioned, <laughs> hmm? <laughs> okay, but, but these are all important. But the second one is that it was never racist. It was never a racist practice. It was never targeting a particular race. In fact, the majority of slaves during uh, the, the uh, you know, Islamic era were from Central Asia. Okay, 
Uh, so it was not, but it had people of all races. It was basically a non-racist institution. In other words, had people of all races, Arabs, uh, you know, Adam, Arab, uh, you know, Persian, uh, Ro Roman, uh, African, everybody. Okay, so the third one is, you could then, I want you to get these out, you know, up front, and then talk about everything else. But we'll talk about Islam did not invent it. Did not invent it. It was an established thing. And then you would want to say that their, uh, Islam, the, the gradual depletion of slavery, the system of Islam made gradual depletion of slavery, put so much emphasis on the gradual depletion of slavery by uh, increasing the tributaries, uh, the branches, and limiting the tributaries. The tributaries into the river of slavery became one thing only, which is the combination of kufr and harb. You cannot enslave people unless there is this combination of kufr and harb. Kufr alone without harb, you can't enslave them. Harb, which is war, alone without kufr, if you fight against Muslims, you cannot enslave them. It is the combination of kufr and harb that became the only source of slavery in Muslim history. Which meant to what? That they were not killed. That there was interest to keep them alive. There was economic incentive for the warriors because these are people that killed your brothers. You know, and it is human nature that you want to, to avenge your people, your father who just died, your brother, and so on. So there was an economic incentive here to keep them alive so that Al Hassan al Basri can come from the, you know, a lineage of uh, enslaved people, so that Ata, so that all of the, you know, the, the greatest Tabi'een can be born into Islam uh, from uh, ex-slaves. Okay, uh, so, so the, the depletion, and then we even have the system of mukataba where they can uh, like earn their freedom, so that is giving them the, the empowering them to earn their freedom and making it, is making it binding on the Muslim community to support them if they show a sort of potential to be independent and to earn their freedom, and so on. And number five is the treatment of slaves that is matchless, and you could mention, like Napoleon, for instance, talking about the, the, the excellent treatment of slaves in, uh, in, um, in, in, in Muslim history or in the Muslim um, countries. Uh, the slaves became sultans. Uh, you know, the, we have Dawlat al-Mamalik, we have the dynasty of the slaves, ex-slaves, but uh, upward mobility was uh, very uh, easy. Uh, during the time of Tabi'in, it's called the Asr al-Mawali, the, the, the era of the freed slaves, because they were the masters of the sciences uh, during Asr al-Tabi'in. And we had the dynasty of the slaves, which is ex-slaves. Uh, these are just quick ones, but just try to remember them and uh, to bring them up when this discussion, discussion comes. To try to be well-versed and poised and eloquent and uh, sort of smart, logical. Uh, now, when it comes to the nafaqa on them, when it comes to the nafaqa on the slaves, uh, where are they placed in the order of nafaqa? Where are they placed in the order of nafaqa? Before your children. Before your children. Before your children. After your wife only. Why? Because the wife is a contractual relationship. Okay? It comes first. The slaves are a form of a contractual relationship. They come second. The, your children, it's silla because of their, you know, closeness to, to you, they come after the slaves. So first you, 
like if you have food, you take a bite, give your wife a bite, give your slave a bite, then give your children a bite. Uh, now, your children a bite first or your parents? That's, that's controversial. You know, you could give precedence to your children because, of their, because they are little, or you could give precedence to your parents because of their right. Uh, but anyway, but the, or, the order before this is you take a bite, then you give your wife a bite, then you give your slave a bite, then you give your child uh, slash parent a bite. Okay. Now, then they talked about النفقه على البهائم because you know in in the in their in the books they talked about نفقه على البهائم and they forced you to sell your uh, uh, livestock if you're unable to uh, yeah so if someone fi found an emaciated donkey for instance they can report it to the authorities and then they will come to the owner and they will force the owner to sell the donkey uh, or if it is a cow, they will force him to slaughter the cow, because you know life and misery, the death for the cow would be better than life in misery and hunger. So they'll force him to slaughter the cow to sell the donkey, uh, and uh, you know not keep an animal that you are incapable of supporting. So you get like a cat, and you you're not, you don't have enough money to spend on the cat or this or that. They'll force you to um, to get rid of the animal uh, so that the animal can be afforded sort of food, sustenance. And you know, the cha the, the, this chapter is actually a marvelous chapter in the books of fiqh and the books of furu'a details of fiqh. Uh, go read it in Sharh Muntah al-Iradat or Kashaf al or some uh, Hanbali book, if, if you can. It's really an interesting uh, subject. Uh, anyway, we'll stop here and we'll come back in uh, three minutes to finish the last uh, chapter, which is a small one, on Al-Walima or the uh, wedding banquet.